Okay. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, best uh, regards from Brussels. My name is Andrew Kubilius. I'm a member of European Parliament and also coordinator of the uh, Forum of the Friends of European uh, Russia. And we are starting our traditional webinar. Uh, today's webinar, uh, as you can see from our title, is uh, devoted to the presentation of the book of How to Slay a Dagon, Building a New Russia After Putin which uh, uh, is published by Mikhail Khodorkovsky. So there is no uh, need perhaps to introduce Mikhail Borisovich, you know, with long explanations uh, who he is and what he is doing really, but uh, we are very happy to have him here on our, on our webinar today. Knowing his uh, very clear and active position, anti-war position, and also his position in trying to help Russian uh, transformation back to European Russia. Uh, so we are really very happy that uh, today we shall have possibility to, uh, to listen to the presentation of his recent book, How to Slay the Dragon. I will not uh, try to explain about uh, what is this book about, but uh, really, when I uh, read it, I was very much impressed uh, because, in my view, uh, it's one of the first uh, Russian opposition uh, strategy books. Exactly know where uh, we can see very clear um, evaluation both of the uh, Russian situation of today and clear, clear. Uh, plan how uh, really Russia can be uh, reformed and transformed. But today also we shall have a very good uh, partner in that conversation with uh, Mikhail Borisovich. I'm very happy also that we are joined by Stefan Hall, Associate Fellow at the Henry Jackson Society, uh, Lecturer, Assistant Professor in Russian and Post-Soviet Politics, uh, from University of Bath, who recently presented uh, very important and very well sought uh, paper with the title Getting a Foot in the Door, Creating a Future uh, Russia Now. So we shall really have two, two uh, distinct, what you know, distinct with. Uh, speakers uh, who will speak about the same, about the future of Russia. And that is what we are discussing back here in European Parliament. Uh, in uh, We are preparing special report now. I am standing rapporteur on Russia, but also we are continuing those discussions in the format of Brussels Dialogue, uh, where after the conference, big conference in June, we created uh, Brussels Dialogue Steering uh, Committee, really in order to uh, to look uh, how Europe, how European Union can uh, build a much more clear strategy towards uh, Russia. Uh, and that is, from our point of view, is one of the most important strategic uh, goals for the next decade for Europe to have uh, Russia going through transformation after losing the war in Ukraine, because transformation of Russia really is what can open the window of opportunity to have uh, sustainable, sustainable peace on European continent. I will stop here my introduction. Now a few words about uh, logistics. Here is a uh, translation you can use if uh, you will need it from Russian to English. Uh, so my request to speakers to speak uh, uh, now a little bit slower in order for interpreter to be uh, able to translate. And then after initial presentations by both uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky and Stefan uh, Hall, we shall have a uh, uh, possibility for Q&A session, for discussion. So, and as always, your questions should be written 
in chat and then we shall try uh, to see how we can elaborate our discussion. So now, uh, Mikhail Borisovich, Slova vam. Thank you. I'll go straight to the gist. The book was written in response to a request or rather a statement about the fact that that the Russian democratic opposition do not have any vision of the future. They do not have any transition ideas about how to transit to that future. In fact, there is a vision. And in fact, today, currently, it has found its main uh, principles and it is a consensus of sorts Nevertheless, when I have to answer each time the same question, and I had to do that many times, and in order to put it in writing, I, in fact, decided to write this book. I think that the process of transition from the existing Putin regime to a situation to a post-Putin situation is going to take place within the decade, within the forthcoming decade. The reason for that is as follows. Russian history has taught us that Russian autocrats, Russian dictators generally live between 70 and 80, the age of 70 and 80, and there is no reasons to believe that, in fact, this time, it's going to be different. In the same way, we could say that based on the historical past, in the post-Putin period, there's going to be a short period of changes of rulers, at the end of which we will either get a new period of authoritarianism or yet another attempt to turn Russia to face Europe, to follow a European path of development. So what we are trying to do is trying to turn Russia to that path of European development after Putin has left the stage. Why do I think this is relevant? Why do we need to talk about it now? The reason is that the preparation needs a lot of time, serious time. So the key issue here that we need to resolve or to find a solution for is whether we want to see someone who is a good guy, someone replacing Putin who is going to take Russia to democracy, or do we want to see the elimination of Putin's post altogether, this sort of single rule of Russia, that kind of post, and to replace that post of the separation of powers by the separation of powers and deep federalization of the country. In other words, to create a system of checks and balances. Both paths have their own support groups supporters or fans. The first one is a traditional one. And a certain part of, of the Russian opposition favor it because it is traditional in the sense of Russian history, but at the same time, it has always led us to a defeat, a failure. Despite that, some of Western polit polit politicians and political analysts see this as a favored path. And they think, oh, good guy, a good guy that would use a firm hand, a firm grip in order to take Russia into democratic, into democratic future. I'm deeply convinced, and this is what I'm writing about in the book, that this is a tragic era. This would be a tragic era because 
our history only has one guy who has tried to rule the country without looking for an external enemy. His name was Gorbachev, and very quickly he lost his grip on power. We have all learned his lesson. So any good guy, so-called good guy, will be looking for an external enemy. The second model is less traditional, is less habitual, and unfortunately the model of federalization, the model of building a parliamentary republic, apart from the fact that it is a new model, a novel model, there is another quite an unpleasant facet or aspect linked to the fact that this model follows the priorities set by society itself. And what are those priorities? They are diverse. And in fact, very likely, it is very likely that we will not get a united democratic Russia. We will have, in fact, different territories, parts of Russia, who find themselves in different political organization types. But Russia as a whole could still become much more democratic than it is currently. The second disadvantage of the second model is the fact that it could become more democratic or could not become more democratic because, in fact, judging by documents, even the Soviet Union was a parliamentary and deeply federalized country, according to the documents. So we have to understand that this is just a chance. It is not a surety. It is not a guarantee. So this is the choice we have today. What inspires me is the fact that if 25 years ago, when we started talking about the parliamentarian model in Russia, parliamentarism in Russia, people joked about it. It was a joke. Today, for residents of large cities in Russia, the parliamentary model is a mainstream idea. Instead of answering the question of who is going to replace Putin, they now understand, people now understand that they have to answer a different question, what is going to happen after Putin, or what is going to replace Putin. Whereas the problem of federalization has seriously emerged on the agenda after the start of this war, because even at that moment, it is at that moment when the regions realized that the federal center could take them directly into a grave, literally speaking. No equally important aspect of the problem is the fact that the foundations, the basis for building such a model, the foundations of the institutionalized changes in Russia is being laid, or rather not laid, today. And this is what something I'm writing about in my book as well. If this transition is implemented by a revolutionary party, in this case, we are almost inevitably going to get yet another authoritarian regime. If we do, on the other hand, want to change the system, then the coalition model has to be built today. It has to be constructed today. It is today, in order to build this coalition model, or rather to destroy it, the, it is the West who has the greatest impact on whether it is being built or being destroyed. And I'm grateful to Andres Kubilius for his efforts in this area. Unfortunately, there are people, other people, who are suggesting that the opposite should be done. So overall, this is what my book is about. Then 
I also look in detail at the problems which are being actively discussed within the Russian opposition, such as registration, making the lists of thousands of people whose sanctions should apply it against, how the sanctions should work or not work, what are human rights, what is the choice between justice and mercy, how we should put an end to the war against Ukraine and how it should be done, and so on and so forth. I cannot say or claim to have succeeded the ultimate answers to finding ultimate answers to all these questions, but at least the spectrum of the discussions that are taking place within the democratic opposition is something that I've managed to outline, including my choice as well. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mikhail Borisovich. And let's go back to what you have just told us. Uh, oh, no, we'll go back to it a little bit later. Now we're going to move on and give the floor to our second speaker, to Stephen Hall. Over to you, Stephen. Well, thank you, Andreas, and uh, especially Mikhail. Um, it was very, very, uh, very enlightening and good to hear again. Certainly, I um, I'm not going to go into detail in regards to the need for the West or Western governments, the European Union, uh, Britain, America, to support support Ukraine. I think we can all agree that this is what should happen, and it's not the case of supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes. It's supporting it to win this war as quickly as possible. Um, yes, it is in regards to, oh, sorry, the office has sent a message. Um, okay, uh, should I carry on or? Absolutely, you should go on. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay. it's a, wait, uh, yeah. I apologize, right. Um, yes, the, the um, you know, the Ukraine should be given the opportunity to win this war as quickly as possible and to do it because this will be the catalyst, I argue, for the change in Russia, and this will lead to Putin, who has tied himself to making sure that Russia wins this war in Ukraine, is going to find it incredibly difficult if Ukraine pushes Russia back to uh, 1992, to the 1992 borders. But anyway, let's focus on Russia and what has to happen in the future. I think that there is a need to talk to the the elite within russia and i appre appreciate that this is abhorrent when we say that we need to talk to the elite but in my own research on autocracies we need to find ways to break the links between the elites and i think this can be done by providing a coherent plan as to what a future russia could look like ultimately a lot of the political elites within the regime perceive themselves to be patriots and that this is a way for them to see that there is a potential future that may or may not include them in it, but at least can be positive to, for, for Russia. And I think that this is something that needs to be done. I'm in no way advocating that this should be the West talking with the Russian government about trying to negotiate a settlement in regards to the war. That's something for the Ukrainians to do, and that's by the by. But in terms of trying to find splinter the elites into hardliners, into softliners, in order to create paranoia within the regime as well, there should be dialogue that's going on between uh, Western countries or Western representatives or countries like Turkey and Brazil that potentially the West can convince to be the third party within these talks. But I think... The key thing really is that the West, and I use the word collective West, the European Union, the member states of the European Union, should really start to find ways to create a safe space for the Russian opposition and in the broadest sense, civil society, the media, 
politicians to be able to come together in a safe haven and be able to build a plan or create a plan for future Russia. Because when the regime collapses, and it will do, I agree with Mikhail, that it will collapse. The West needs to be ready to get its foot in the door as to what is going to happen. Now, to do this, this means that Western governments should increase the number of visas for Russians, not just for Russians in Russia, but for those in the diaspora who have fled Russia since Russia's war on Ukraine, allow them to come to the West to have a safe haven to build up civil society, to, co to create a coalition of opposition politicians planning for the future. In regards to media, this is the way for the opposition, for the diaspora to get its voice back into Russia. And certainly from what we've seen, Google has, has taken away the advertising revenue for Russian opposition bloggers on YouTube and vehicle, social media, places like that. And this, the opposition should certainly create a whitelist of media that should be allowed to raise money through adv advertising and therefore be able to build up its media capacity in regards to creating an audience in Russia or building that audience in Russia. Supporting the diaspora is very important because the diaspora is the West's link back into Russia. Not only will they be able to phone up their families and friends and say that, yes, it's easy to get a relatively easy to get a visa to Italy, Germany, Lithuania, France, where have you. It's also relatively easy to find a housing, to set up a bank account, to find a job. And this is something that the West should make easier through something like a diaspora, diaspora ambassador, supporting Russians who have come to the West in order to build up their lives and to work towards creating civil society organizations and un uniting the opposition around a coherent plan for creating a future Russia. Another aspect, and I think because Whilst I am optimistic that this will be over in a decade, maybe 15 years from now, that the West needs to be prepared for this, that there is also this need to prepare for what could very well be a long term gain. And that is to create a university, I would say, a free Russia university, similar to the um, European University in Be of Belarus, which is now based in Vilnius, in terms of the fact that this is a way to create a or to train the next generation of elites, not just in politics, but in business, in culture as well, in law, to give them the opportunity and the training to see what the West has in terms of political systems, in terms of institutions, that can then they can go away and think about how those could be implemented or something similar could be implemented in Russia. Now, whilst we can all agree that Putin is an autocrat and there are probably stronger words like, like dictator that other people have used in the past to explain the Putinist system, he has retained the settings or the trappings, I should say, of democracy in terms of parliament, in terms of state institutions, they do exist in Russia. And so in some respects, when the regime collapses, and it will, those institutions can are, they exist at the moment as shells, but they can be fleshed out with what has happened, with ideas and means to create a stronger state within Russia, a democratic state within Russia. And most importantly, I think that the opposition, civil society should not just focus as potentially it has in the past with Moscow, St. Petersburg, the key cities. It needs to look to the regions because a Russia that is a federal entity that allows minority rights, that allows different cultures, there's over 100 ethnic groups within Russia to flourish is also a stronger state. And that can be done, I think, by engaging with the regions to a far greater extent. Now, I've said some things that I appreciate are perhaps 
an academic sitting in his ivory tower, pie in the sky thinking this sort of thing. And I appreciate that this may seem difficult to conceptualize at the moment, but I think that the Andreas has done still excellent work in terms of trying to begin this process in the European Union. And I think we need to talk about how to help the Russian diaspora develop the plan for future Russia. It has to come from the Russians, but the West has the opportunity, not just to support Ukraine, but to support Russia in terms of building towards a future Russia. I heard a lot over the past year and a half during this war, that actually what the West should do is simply close the drawbridge, build a moat around Russia with barbed wire fencing, a concrete wall, machine gun posts, and just it's up to the Russians to deal with this, with, with what they've done. The Russians are culpable for what has happened. And Paul, yes, Russians do bear some responsibility, it has to be said. But we should be magnanimous in terms of supporting Russia to help itself, that there is a need to look to the future because a democratic Russia is one that is going to make European security and Western security in general safer. Now, if we close up the drawbridge, if we allow Russia to say, say to the Russians, go ahead and deal with your problems, then this would be a disaster. Because very few people, having seen what the Russian army has done in places like Bucha, in Irpin, are going to go and say, yes, I'm going to go out and protest against what is a highly repressive state. And I, you know, this, this simply will not happen. People are not, on the whole, most people are not brave enough to go out knowing that they are going to have their heads kicked in. So we have to support Russia in regards to in regards to building up what it needs for a civil society. And we have to provide the Russian opposition, civil society, diaspora media, with all the tools that they need to do this. And we also need to refute, refute the idea of closing Russia off and letting the Russians deal with their with, with their problem themselves, because that would be a disaster. It would also mean that the regime, which is highly repressive, would continue to be highly repressive and go, continue on its trajectory towards a police state. We also need to support Ukraine and to make help Ukraine win this war as quickly as possible. Because the idea that Russia will be revanchist if it loses to me, is nonsensical. Russia is already revanchist. If it can spin the war in Ukraine as a victory in any way, we will be back here again in a decade. And Putin will be able to legitimate himself again by saying, we have beaten NATO. We've, just, we've fought 50 plus countries from the West and we've bought, we fought them at least to a standstill. And we will be back here again in a decade. So the West needs to support Ukraine, but it also needs to support the Russian diaspora as it builds towards a future plan for Russia. I'd like to finish there. Uh, thank you very much. Those are my initial thoughts. Well, Stefan, thanks a lot for clarity of your message. Uh, you know, at least we, you know, in in the parliament group of so-called reporters, we are on a very similar, you know, thinking. So. Uh, I would, yeah, it's pity that, you know, Britain left the European Union, I would say, you know, because <laughs> it would be very good to have, you know, such kind of thinking, you know, back into, into, into EU institutions, really, and to, and to develop such kind of strategy. Now we're turning, yeah, thanks a lot for presentations. Uh, now we're turning to Q&A or, or, you know, discussion. So I would suggest that you should look also into the chat. Uh, and uh, then you know you will you will be able to answer you know some questions. But now I see that you know my colleague Rasev Knevich, uh, uh, you know jumped into and she wants to speak you know also or to ask or to say a few words. Rasev Knevich, a member of European Parliament, also from Lithuania. Go, Rasev. Thank you very much, uh, and. Uh... 
First of all, thank you for uh, this presentation of, of, of the book of Mikhail Khodorkovsky. And since uh, uh, it is written, as I understand, in Russian, and uh, Mikhail, uh, Mikhail uh, was speaking in Russian, maybe I'll, I'll uh, is, if it's possible, if translation is going on, I can also switch into my not perfect, but, uh, but Russian uh, use opportunity. Mr. Khodorkovsky, in fact, it was today that I met with some people from memorial, not from the memorial who we're all familiar with, but from the St. Petersburg Memorial, representatives who came to Brussels 10 years ago. They were the first who were called or labeled foreign agents. And we talked about you. We talked about your strategy of future in Russia or future Russia. I have a question regarding your vision of Russia with those people who live in Russia, different ethnic groups, some larger groups or the North Caucasus, because in my opinion, if there is any chance of democratization in Russia, I'm not sure that they would want to stay within the Russian Federation, to be part of the Russian Federation, to remain part of the Russian Federation. And then the smaller indigenous peoples of Siberia, who their history is the history of colonial past of Russia or Russian imperialist past. And with the knowledge of their own history, the history of the title nation, titular nation, I don't like this definition, but those who call themselves Russians in Russia. So in order to transform Russia into a different system. How do you think Russia would need to reassess or what it would need to reassess its colonial past, its history, and also send a very clear signal or signals, a very clear message to those indigenous peoples or those peoples of Russia who have been living under the Russian rule for over 100 years. And we're talking about human rights and the rights of those indigenous peoples being violated, being usurped, suppressed. So this is my question. And this is my idea of how painful and difficult this is going to be, this process of reassessing the past, rethinking the past dealing with the past, not only in order to create a new system, but you need to deal with the past. You have to deal with the entire history. The Russian people will have to think about it. They have to deal with the past and they have to think about how to live with these indigenous peoples and other peoples of Russia in the future. Thank you for your question. Yes, yes, Mikhail, over to you. Thank you for your question. In spring this year, the Russian Democratic Opposition in Berlin adopted the Berlin Declaration outlining its unequivocal attitude, read the unacceptability of any imperialist model, either within Russia or beyond it. This is a fundamental statement. And now let's go into details. There are certain things where there are there is consensus within the opposition. The full consensus, for instance, in relation to the right of every nation, every ethnic group in Russia to develop their language their culture 
And there is also consensus regarding the fact that Russia as a federation has to help them, particularly the smaller indigenous peoples for whom it is very difficult to do for financial reasons. There is also a less clear consensus or less obvious consensus in relation to the fact that each nation or people, each subject of the Russian Federation or entity of the Russian Federation should have a right to decide about staying or leaving the Russian Federation. This is not an easy issue because a decision to secede should be a free decision. They should be free to decide. They should be to make it in a very conscious way. And in order to respect all the rights of the people living on the territory of that region. And finally, there is also another issue over which there is little acceptance or rather no acceptance whatsoever. And that is the question posed by a number of representatives of the Russian peoples or nations is the fact that they have their titular territories where they're titular nations and therefore in order to vote whether to stay within the federation or to leave the federation or to secede this kind of vote should be given only to the indigenous peoples themselves and their representatives this is not something there is which is uh, universally accepted because sometimes those ethnic groups are in the minority in those regions in many cases particularly if we're talking about the north caucasus in, uh, the titular territory is argued over with their neighbors the territory there are territorial disputes and in other cases you could only resolve whether this person belongs to the title nation or whether their ancestors have mixed in with lots of different nations, you would have to use methods that Adolf Hitler resorted to. So in fact, there is a number, so there's quite, a, there is almost no consensus and rather little acceptance or acknowledgement of this kind of step. So the model of deep federalization would allow for resolving the majority of these problems. Thank you. I can see a new range of questions emerging. I would like to allocate them to different speakers. So Stephen, I can see. I am looking to Stefan, yeah. Okay, good. So uh I, I i would just uh, first of all logistics i would again urge everybody who who is using interpretation who needs interpretation to look into into interpretation button and here you can ch make a choice of your of, of the language which you need Mikhail Borisovich, пара вопросов которых я просто так вот попытаюсь очень okay быстро. a couple of questions to Mikhail quickly Helmut Kass quotes one of the authors, John Mershemir, who says that Ukraine is losing the war, they're not winning the war, which means a picture is different from what we are painting here. Knowing that you are working in this area as part of your anti-war committee on issues of assisting Ukraine. My first question, and I'm going to join it, what is the situation today as far as you're concerned in your assessment, in your evaluation on the battlefield and politically? Russia's war against Ukraine, how is it going? The second one, 
is Homans. To what extent you think that some of the capitals in the West have quite a lot of fears regarding the fact that after what we are talking about now, after Ukraine's victory over Russia and the collapse of Putin's regime, Russia, or the situation in Russia might actually deteriorate, become worse, riotous, uncontrollable, Prigozhin-like, mutinous, dangerous, unstable, and therefore helping would become quite questionable. Do we need to have this kind of victory of Ukraine that would lead to such unintended consequences in Russia? And perhaps there might be some danger in providing weapons to Ukraine. So what is your position on that? To what extent the West believes, as far as you're concerned, that Russia could transform in that direction? It would totally... Is this question to me or to Stephen? To you? Well, with your permission, I... I'm not going to be very diplomatic. And please do not be offended. Because I'm not an experienced politician yet. Given today's volume of supplies of weapons to Ukraine, Ukraine is not going to win this war. If we think that the victory means going back to the borders of 1991. I don't see any intention to increase the volume of aid to Ukraine to the level which would allow and permit Ukraine to push Russia back to the borders of 1991. Because this aid is not being paid for by me. It is being paid for by mostly Ukraine, uh, American taxpayers, and to a lesser extent by European taxpayers. I really have no right to direct Europe or the United States on how to use their money. However, even because of that, and mostly because of that, any conversation about the collapse of Putin's regime as a result of Ukraine's victory has no substance at the moment. No point. But the idea that there might be something worse after Putin is erroneous, is a mistake, and is dangerous because Putin's regime is leading to the collapse of Russia is leading to the chaos on the territory of Russia within the next 10 years. It is Putin's regime because there's tension which is growing and consequences of these tensions could be dire. I don't understand. What could be worse than Putin? Because Putin has unleashed a full-scale war with a neighboring state. He has threatened using nuclear weapons three times. And the only reason why he has not resorted to nuclear weapons still, or yet, or carpet bombing, is the reason that this would actually make his position worse. It would exacerbate his position because of America's position, because of China's position, because of the position of other Putin's so-called allies within the Western political elite. Thank you. Another couple of questions. Georgi is asking this. How long would be necessary in order to, for the systemic changes that you're talking about, came true? 
Russia's historical experience has shown that after the demise or of a dictator or, or an autocrat who have been ruling for such a lengthy period of time, you need about three years or during the three years there is a sort of quick changeover of people in power. This happened after Stalin. This also took place after Brezhnev's demise. So it, it's likely to happen after Putin as well. For the next three years, there's going to be this quick turnover. And then either Russia would enter the next new circle of authoritarian rule, that is, if the West helps Russians to choose the idea of a good czar, a good guy, or there might be a likelihood of Russia emerging as a democratic state, moving towards the democratic trajectory to a parliamentary model and to a deep federalization. The further development, the realization by society of its blame, guilt, for what has happened, dealing with the past, reviewing its history. Unfortunately, Germany and its example has shown us that this could only happen when several generations are changed. So about 20 years on, in two decades. And of course, the first series of questions, in fact, bring up another question. You talked about the federalization and the regions. Benedict Herman is asking the question, what about municipalization of Russia? Municipalization of Russia, meaning that the regions cannot remain uh, as democratic because they could actually stay authoritarian. What about rights of municipalities or local government, because there's been a huge reform in Ukraine undertaken on Hromadas or local government. How likely is this model in Russia? I'm grateful for this question. The first draft of the book was called Gardarika, a country of cities. I totally agree with the idea that a stable construct of Russian government would look like a triangle, the federal center, federal entities, and cities. Large cities who have their own political weight against the background of the municipalization of the country that would create a balance, a certain balance, a counterweight or counterpoint to the regional entities who have gained or will have gained much greater autonomy than they enjoy today. So this triangle of power, triangle of government is the most stable model for future Russia. I, I don't Thank you, to... Mikhail. Uh, well, here were uh, different questions. Perhaps you are able to follow what is in the chat, and you can pick what what you would like to uh, to comment. But uh, I would uh, put a very general question, since you really put very clear argument why the Western uh, you know, uh, democracies need to have a strategy on Russia. And that strategy should be linked with our you know, support to Ukraine, which is really not enough. And Mikhail Borisovich, uh, absolutely right. Uh, I looked into the numbers, how much you know, the West is uh, giving uh, weapons 
if to recalculate it into into you know monetary uh, numbers i was quite surprised the reason i did that you know very simple research and it appears that 27 billion of european union uh, military support means only 0.15 of the whole gdp of european union and the same goes with the united states and so on so definitely this is not what uh, what can bring Ukrainian victory very soon. I hope that it will improve. But my question would be, Stefan, to you, what's about uh, Great Britain government? I mean, how much they are looking into some kind of this, you know, strategic approach to future of Russia? Or that's still academic, you know, work what you are doing? Or maybe maybe Britain can show an example to all the other, you know, Western Western democracies. I think at the moment it is, that's why we had the discussion in in Parliament the other week. It is an academic, uh, well, not academic, that's, that's not the right phrase, but it is a discussion that needs to be made and that Parliament, British parliamentarians need to listen to. So to have that discuss, begin that discussion is pretty much where we are. In terms of what Britain can do, I think that you know it, it is out, it is outside the european union now sadly in my opinion but that's by the by um and that there is now a need for them to try and provide yet more weaponry and also to start funding the the russian diaspora diaspora that is already in the uk in terms of getting them to come together at the moment, I think that Britain is the discussion has started as it has started from uh, what what your role in terms of the European Union. This is a discussion that the West needs to start having very conclusively because time is of the essence, and I think that this is where we can begin this the, these talks rather than anything concrete at the moment. Yeah, Stephen, if you will see other questions, please, you know, raise your hand, uh, which you want to answer, and immediately I will give you the floor. But now we have uh, Roland Fronerstein, uh, our uh, our really good friend from Globsec, who is really participating quite often in our in our conversations on Russia. He put one question, but uh, I would like him to take the floor because uh his question is quite philosophical and perhaps he will he will you know explain much better what he wants to uh, what 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 he wants to ask roland yeah yeah with you everyone uh thanks for good giving... afternoon well you know philosophical question i'm i'm german i can't hide that so um let me do my best here what will define the russianness of a new democratic, federalist, and non-imperial, post-imperial Russia. Uh, you know, I'm asking, I mean, of course, you can ask what makes England English or France French, but I think there is a reason to ask about this new Russian identity because it will differ substantially from the cultural uh, definitions of Russia in the past. Uh, and since it will be multi-ethnic and um, respectful of, of culture and languages uh, and a great number of cultures and languages, I think it is legitimate to ask what will make that new Russia Russian? Uh, what will be the definition of Russian identity in the future then? Thank you. Yeah, Mikhail Borisovich, вопрос вам. Mm -hmm. so, the Russian identity of the new Russia, how would you understand it? How would you describe it? How would you define it? Yes, indeed. In fact, I write about that in my book. Indeed, what unites different peoples into political nations? We have an expression. If what unites us is more important than our differences, if 
it's more important that our difference then there is point there is a point of living together within one nation state and forming a political nation if this is not the case if our differences are greater there is no point in it whatsoever of that kind of coexistence what forms a political nation what constitutes it it hasn't changed over the past century first of all it is our language russia as distinct from many countries in europe is a country with a uniform language really if go from the western border to the furthest eastern border of russia and you would encounter pure russian a pure russian language without any dialects or hardly visible dialects people would always understand each other secondly it is a common understanding and perception of history it could be today's perception which i don't like it could be a different perception for instance something we would like to see in its place but it is some kind of common pride of its history and also some common vision of the future of russia apart from that there are also cultural habits economically tradition relations and engagements with their own problems still traditional and the presence of which is more important than their absence the existence of which there is also a whole set of threats not just across western borders that have been very peaceful until very recently but thanks to putin that has changed but there are many more hot borders much more unstable borders that russia has and so on and so forth so if there is a nation or an entity or in russia for instance in the north caucasus that they think that this is doesn't make sense and it isn't important for them if it's not important for them all these different aspects there's no point or it's very unlikely that they would want to remain or it is worth for them to remain as part of russia as part of that federation or be part of the political nation that we are trying to build thank you another couple of questions Mikhail Boris to you from what I see written in chat will the Russian government in exile or will you set up the Russian government in exile or the Russian opposition set up such a government in exile or is there going to be a Russian political party in exile what would you say would you create such or such a party or such a government a political party or polit political parties definitely will emerge as for the political coalition or structure or framework that would have three objectives stopping the war regime change and holding fair elections this coalition that existed in many countries and got the general title of popular front or something similar we are trying to set up something similar here as well as for the government in exile or a government in exile i'm rather skeptical about this notion i think that a state or government is something about force and power so what distinguishes a government or a state from other institutions is their right to legitimate violence or to use violence legitimately if the right and opportunity to use legitimate force 
are absent, then you cannot call yourself a government, the Supreme Soviet of the galaxy or whatever else. You can, of course, call yourself that, but it would just be a public association without any legitimate right to use force. So I would prefer this to be called a coalition rather than a government in exile. I, I have some problem with the words. What is going on? Okay, maybe now it's, it's better. So, question to Stefan Who in the Russian elites should the West go to? Uh, because uh, uh, you said that in order to splinter the Russian elites, the West should talk to them. Uh, what a concrete question, maybe with the names, I don't know, but you know, I will put maybe a broader question. Uh, since you have spoken really that it would be a big mistake, uh, or you wrote in your in your paper, it would be a big mistake to think that Russia can be, you know, oh, left, uh, left uh, uh, for you no. Know, uh, to development on its own, whatever you know will happen, we can you know build the walls, the walls you know, and uh, not look uh, into Russian developments as something of our business. I absolutely agree with your with your point of view, but uh, the problem is that uh, quite uh, a lot of people and decision makers in in Europe, you know, do not believe that Russia can become a different country. So Putin was quite successful during those 20 years to convince everybody around in the West that, you know, Russia is some kind of wild Eastern nation and democracy is not possible in Russia at all or transformation of Russia into what, what Mikhail Borisovich is speaking. And, and then the question is for us, you know, for, for, for the people in the West who believe that Russia can become different. How we can convince, you know, others? How, what should be our tactic? What should be our strategy? How to convince, you know, governments in the West that really uh, transformation in Russia is possible and that is why we need to have a strategy, how to help that, such transformation, and then we need to have even tactics with whom to speak, you know. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. Okay, I, I can start uh, almost immediately and I'll uh, talk about, well, the the, cl the class I, I just gave uh, at, at university today is on transitions to democracy. And we use Samuel Huntington's thesis. And Samuel Huntington was very clear that Confucian societies can't, will always remain autocratic or have autocratic um, systems weak democracies, if you want to call it that, and he uses South Korea and Taiwan as examples. T today, South Korea is a bustling democracy. Taiwan is a bustling democracy. Even further back, we could, uh, we could argue places like Spain and Portugal were considered, the famous phrase, Africa begins at the Pyrenees, as terrible as it was, is the idea that Spain and Portugal can't do democracy. The very idea that Russia can't do democracy, that somehow Russians are ambivalent towards democracy, the political, they can't hold free and fair elections, they can't have a free media, they can't have a burgeoning civil society, they can't have minority rights. I'm sorry, that, that's nonsensical to me. And so the idea that telling Western politicians that this country can't do democracy, we should give up, is... The, a terrible thing to do because there's been Western democracy has taken centuries. Britain took centuries to build a democracy that may or may not be that democratic today with its electoral system for 900 years. So, no, I don't agree that this idea that the West can't do democracy. Now, I'll answer the question from Katia, and it's, it's good to hear from her. Um, when I was talking about helping you know talking to the elites i'm not going to name names i think the idea is simply that regimes do generally autocracies do have hardliners and softliners 
and the, the Western representatives need to find a way to talk to the different groups within Russia. We also know that this is also a way Putin is increasingly, I think his inner circle is getting smaller and smaller over time and has done since the pandemic. If he starts to hear rumours that some of his elite, some of his Ill regime personnel are talking to their counterparts in the West, he will become even more repressive. If they go to him, he will start to fear others are also talking to the West. And this becomes increasingly hard for him to hold on to power. He will become repress increasingly more repressive and he will move against different personnel. Also, we know we we know that certainly some elite groups have different opinions as to where they want Russia to be. And I think the West needs to support that in a way to try and split these factions from each other. That's how it has worked in the past. And I imagine it would work again in, in the future in regards to other autocracies that have democratized. Now, that's by the by. Um, in terms of dismantling the various security services, I think that has to happen. This was a mistake that was made in the 1990s, that the KGB was not lustrated. And I think that this certainly is something that needs to happen in the future, or at the very least, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, like in South Africa, where those people in the KG, in the FSB, in the GRU, in the SBR, what have you, can be held to account publicly. And I think that that does need to happen in the future. But this, again, is something that the report is about how the West can support the Russian diaspora, diaspora in planning towards a future Russia. It's up to the Russians, as I've said repeatedly, they have the agency, they have to go out and actually come up with this plan. But I think that we need to discuss the possibility of illustration, at least in the future, because the security services cannot be allowed to coalesce power like they did in the 1990s, immediately after the, after the KGB and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the final contribution I want to make, I'm going to ignore the questions about Mearsheimer, um, are that what are the challenges facing the processes of parliamentarianism in Russia? Will the subjects of the Russian Federation accept it? Again, this comes down to the Russian opposition, the media, the civil society, coming up with a coherent plan, talking to one another. There are lots of different ethnic uh, minority groups that exist now in the West. And I think that the Russian opposition needs to come together. Those that are based in Moscow at the federal level and those focused on the regional level, particularly Bryatia, Tuva, where have you. And they need to come up with an idea as to how these republics will, whether these republics, what top, sorry, what type of system these republics will accept as being part of the Russian Federation. And this will probably mean a parliamentary system that gives certain seats to uh ethnic groups but that again is up to the russian diaspora to decide in terms of what the plan will be for the future thank you thanks a lot stephen and uh okay in that case a question to mikhail a very similar question your book really impressive is very impressive impresses me and sets out a clear plan on how to transform Russia, to rebuild Russia. But what would you say to those Western leaders? How would you try to persuade and convince them that Russia could be different? Because since they do not believe it, they would not try to do anything about it in order to assist such a transformation. So how, what would you do? How would you set out to explain to them that the West should have a strategy, that the West should believe or start believing in a different Russia, that Russia is capable of becoming different. If in some Western capitals, they think that Russia has always remained such with no democracy, it has always lived through a series of dragons or czars. You call them dragons, we call them czars. And perhaps, and Ukraine would never win this war. We would just have to adjust to Putin 
to the status quo, to the regime, sit down to a negotiations table, negotiating table, and carry on as usual, business as usual, as before the war. What would you say to such Western leaders who think that? <laughs> One answer is my desire to see the bright future for Russia, but the other answer is prompted by my experience. So one answer is prompted by my desire to see a bright future, but experience, quite considerable experience. And the, what is prompted by my experience is that the Western political leaders, despite the fact that we have been telling them again and again not to do that, they would always try to sit down to a negotiations table with Putin or another person, another autocrat, who stays in power in Russia, who holds on to power in Russia. Why? There is a very simple reason. Russia is a huge country. You cannot build a wall and isolate yourself from Russia. And it's also a rich country, lots of, lots of resources. So there's a point why you want to negotiate with them and therefore we shall negotiate with them and talk to them. What I would like to remind these people of, who think that, is the fact that Putin, of the past decade, has violated his promises, he has broken his promises, international promises, by the way, obligations, so many times, has lied directly, blatantly, so many times, looking them in the eye, so many times, a few months later, did the opposite of what he had promised, that any such negotiations or talks could um, lead their own electorates to asking the question, why are you doing this at our expense using our taxpayers' money when you know very well what's going to happen? So the money spent on such talks or negotiations is the money wasted simply wasted. This is what they think about, you should think about. They should think about that. That any talks with a gang of bandits or gang of gangsters who you cannot, a group of gangsters who you cannot defeat for one way or another, you could talk to such a group of gangsters only when you confront them in a very tough way. You do this, I will do this to you. If you do this, such sanctions would follow. This is what my experience prompts me. Let's look historically at what has happened in the past, what happened in the past, and ask ourselves a question. And Stephen, let's put this question to Stephen. How old is Russia? How old is it? If our answer is, over 1,000 years old, and usually this is what academics tell us, then I would like to remind you that a considerable part of this Russia that is over a 1,000 years old is already democratic or at least moving towards a democracy, towards democracy. This Russia emerged on the banks of the Dnieper, in fact. And we remember Drivliani, Slaviani, the Slavs, the Drevlins, Dreviches, Vatiches, and all the other peoples who no longer exist, but who are now called Russians today as an overall name. So historical experience prompts us or shows us that Russia has been changing, transforming as you moved from Western borders of Russia to its Eastern borders and yet step by step, stage by stage, and the next stage 
in the life of this 1000 year old Russia, the next stage is moving towards democracy. Of course, people will curse me for what I'm saying that or condemn my words, but it is the case. And perhaps the next stage would be Moscow, St. Petersburg, then there's going to be Yekaterinburg, then it will be the turn of Krasnodar and Stavropol and other Russian cities, but we have to work in this direction. We don't have to expect this to happen tomorrow, overnight. Before we ask Stephen about how old Russia is, or Russia's age, I would like to ask another question, to pose another question, posed by Jan Pekla. It's an important question indeed, because what we are discussing at the moment, the fact that the West still lacks a strategy on Russia that perhaps some in the West might desire to go back to talking to Putin, which would be a huge mistake. What about the other neighbor of Russia? What about China? What do you think, Mikhail Boric? What kind of strategy could China have vis-a-vis -vis Russia's future? Do you have any ideas? We can see that Vladimir Putin has tried to build an alternative relationship to his relationship with Europe through his cooperation with China, engagement with China. In fact, relations between Russia and China are objectively important. It's a necessity. China is our gigantic neighbor with a very long border, Russo-Chinese border. But my experience of trying to build links and relations with China has shown, has demonstrated that the best way I've managed to do that when I very obviously for my Chinese partners tried to build a balance of my relations with China and my relations with Europe, with the United States and other partners. So in such a paradigm, building relations with the Chinese was successful, was mostly successful. Putin has foregone that equilibrium with the West. And China, as a very pragmatic partner, as a very pragmatic actor, have used this to their own advantage with great pleasure. If this balance is not restored, the prospect, as I can see them, are very dire, are very dismal. And yet we have to bear in mind that in order to reorient the Russian economy via or to face China is very difficult, almost impossible logistically. We have 120 out of 140 million Russians who live in the European part of Russia, not in the Asian part. So the additional transport costs, talking about additional three to 4,000 kilometers, is too big or too considerable, too huge a damage economically or cost economically to concentrate all Russia's efforts on the Asian or Eastern dimension or direction. So it is most likely that China is going to take advantage of the situation it has found itself that Putin brought Russia to. China doesn't have any interest in the technological development of Russia. It has no interest in moving its technological manufacturing onto Russian soil, and yet high-tech manufacturing. At the same time, they are not interested in annexing Russian territories. What it wants to do is continue deriving profit or advantages of this 
imbalance in the situation. Yes, thank you. We're coming to an end of our discussion. I would ask Mikhail to think about the fact or how he would like to say in conclusion when he's for those who haven't read your book yet, you have to advertise your book after all. I would like to turn to Stephen. And since you know very, very well, you know, as a uh, academician, you know, history of Russia. So what would be your, I mean, conclusions? What, what, you know, what the history of Russia is telling about the future of Russia? What the history of Russia is telling about the future of Russia, that is an excellent question. Um, <laughs> How long do we have in terms of being able to explain over potentially a thousand years of history, beginning with from Kiev and Rus until the present day? I'm not, I'm not saying that Russia is a thousand years old. I plausibly believe the Russian Federation is very young at 19, since 1991. But anyway, um, so, you know, in terms of the future for Russia, there have been periods of attempted liberalisation as it were, throughout Russia. From the 18, 1825 Decemberists, you could argue under Yeltsin, under Gorbachev as well, there have been periods that can be looked at in terms of where Russia could be going. And I think, again, going back into the deeper history, back, it, back to the orig origins of Muscovy, I think Russia has an excellent story to tell. In the same way that Australia talks about the idea that okay unfortunately australia the australian narrative ignores the aborigines and that that is absolutely wrong but the original narrative was that here was a country that was developed from nothing and that they managed to survive and over time built this democracy and this capitalist system and all of this sort of thing that is the narrative I think Russia has something else. Russia has a similar narrative there. Rather than relying on the narrative that Kievian Rus is somehow part of Russia, that Russia's identity is so tied to Ukraine and Crimea that Russia is willing to send its men to die for it on the fields of uh, Donbass, there is a better narrative out there. And that is simply that Muscovy, which was given to um, by the Prince of Vladimir Suzdal to his youngest son as an afterthought, create, developed into such a wonderful, beautiful country in terms of culture, in terms of the geography of Russia. Yes, there are, of course, dark patches in history there always are in every country but there is a narrative that from a swamp a great a country was built moscow is still a global international city and that i think is a huge achievement and something that can be used in the future and also i think goes back to how the future narratives not just reliant on the nationalism the great patriotic war all of this sort of spiel that Putin has developed over time but the narrative can go back that we developed out of something that was an afterthought a swamp effectively into where we are today and there have been dark patches we have to remember those of course the war on Ukraine is absolutely abhorrent but there is certainly a narrative that can be developed that can be used for understand for this future Russia and I think Russia does have a history that can transcend into its future and it is there it's now up to other it's now up to us I say us I, I mean the Russia, Russians to develop that narrative but it is very much there and building towards that future that Russia is both things it is a country that developed as a back from a backwater into where it is today, it's also a new country. Forget the historical narratives, forget the legacies of the Soviet Union. It is a new country and has achieved a lot in a short space of time. And I think that could potentially be a transformation motive. That still needs development, so I need to think it through. You've caught me off off the cuff, as it were, but it certainly is something I think as a narrative could be developed over time. 
Well, thanks a lot, Stephen. You know, it brings some kind of optimism <laughs> in our <laughs> not always very optimistic, you know, discussion. Uh, I'm not a historian. I came into politics from physics, but in my view, you know, Russia is in some way really an European country, which is repeating in some way developments of Europe, but with quite a delay, mm. uh, you know, in time, and sometimes quite a tragic delay. And you know, instead of French Revolution, they got Bolshevik Revolution at the end, you know, and and that is you know the tragedy of of um, not only of Russia but also of of Europe. And and now. Russia is the last, you know, the last empire which started to collapse only on the European continent only in the 1990s and, and facing a lot of, you know, all those post-imperial, uh, you know, syndromes, which sometimes are very painful. I don't know if Great Britain, you know, managed to overcome all, all those, you know, post-imperial uh, syndromes uh, and how much, you know, Brexit uh, was influenced by some of that. But this is another, another topic, another question. So, and now I will turn back to uh, Mikhail. Mikhail, ваше слово заканчивая наш разговор. Рекламу книги... Your conclusion, your advertisement for your book, perhaps. Mikhail, I'm going to remind everyone to buy the book, to read it, because indeed this is a book... When I read it, I could see the future of Russia outlined there through a very pessimistic prism, oh, sorry, optimistic, optimistic, very positive prism, optimistic. Thank you for this opportunity. Yes, this book is in Russian and in English, and in fact, I think it has been translated in German as well. The English title is How to Slay a Dragon. It is very easy to find it on the internet. The point for a Western reader is to look at it through the prism of the fact that it has been written as a conversation between Russian politicians and Russian society. It is a conversation held between Russian politicians and Russian society, Russians. So perhaps you could take an outsider's look at it these are the issues, these are the problems that we mull over and debate within our own society, between ourselves. On many of these issues, we don't, we haven't achieved a consensus, or there is no consensus, but we have either a rapprochement of our positions coming closer together, or we have decided to put it aside, our differences, until the first fair, free and fair elections have been held in Russia, until that moment when Russians themselves can elect or select the concept uh, that they would like to vote for. I fear, I fear that those people who have been voted for are given those votes would rather answer those questions more on the left they would have much more left-wing nationalistic views than those that i am putting forward so they might be more extreme perhaps more nationalistic this is my I, understanding but we would have to live with that this is something that might be given Yes, our society is like that. This is what it's like. And my generation, perhaps, would either never live to see this or perhaps be very old when real changes take place in Russia. But there is a symbol, a very important symbol of such changes. All sociological surveys have shown us that that the main supporters of the so-called special operation, special military operation, are those who are now 50 and older, whereas those who are 30 and younger, in fact, oppose the special military operation. They're against it. So the generational change, the change of the take on the future of Russia is happening. Putin is a fragment, 
is a representative of the generation which is leaving the stage together with me we are the generation of soviet people we are leaving the stage a new generation is replacing us today with a new outlook with a new idea of the future and the present and what is particularly important for the west to understand is that what is being done by the west today specifically when they explain their sanction policy they either create positive relations with this new generation of russians or they don't build those new relations with the new generation of russians and it is the new generation of russians who they would have to live with those people who are 30 40 and even 50 those people living in the west thank you and in conclusion of this conversation i would like to say thanks to stephen and to mikhail and just to read out a small comment from Vladimir in English. adequate and desirable solution for survival of Russia. Much will depend on civil society, so. I keep fingers crossed in hoping that such transformation, transformative change will not be that bloody as they used to be in the past. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Спасибо, Михаил. Thanks a lot, uh, Stephen. Uh, thanks a lot to everybody who were participating in our conversation. We really need to keep our you know, hopes about future of Russia, future of Ukraine, and future of sustainable peace on the European continent. That is what uh, is uh, our vision, our goal, and our task uh, to do everything uh, in order to to, um, to achieve such a uh, very strategic goal. Thanks a lot and good luck to everybody and let's you know meet on other occasions in our webinars. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.